Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. I think it's doing the same thing as it did last time with the live stream. Let me just confirm that it is going. And yeah, looks like it's going, so. All right. Yeah, all right. So for whatever reason, looks like our live stream is actually active, but the software that I use is saying that we're not. So uh, hopefully if anybody watching on the live stream, you know, is sending in a, a note, I'll be able to at least still see it. Otherwise, you know, the questions, if you have any questions afterwards or anything like that, feel free to just send a message along and, and we'll try and answer them afterwards. Uh, and the same goes for everybody that is here live joining us on, on Zoom for the actual session. Uh, you know, you're welcome to drop a question in the chat as needed. Uh, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. We do have a lot of information to cover today, so we're going to try and get through the, the first couple of slides of our presentation fairly quickly. But today is the last of the professional development seminars of our 2022-2023 program year for the Poet Artist Development Program. So those of you that have been enrolled and participating throughout this whole program year, you know, we're coming towards the end. And after today, every Wednesday night, we will start to fully dedicate to uh, you know, the giving you feedback on your writing, making sure that your manuscripts are as polished as possible before we move on to potentially publishing them. And so, you know, I hope that excites all of you. I know I'm excited to see some new work get produced through our program. And yeah, books are in the oven, as Abraham says in the chat. So to get us going, though, like I said, we do have a slideshow to present. Um, for those of you in the program, you already have access to this. Uh, you can download it now on our dedicated Google Classroom. And because this particular slide deck has a lot of uh, links to websites, we will be going over some of them during the, the session today. But just know once you download the handout, you can actually gain access to the websites that we'll be covering uh, pretty easily through the handout. You just click on it as long as it's on your computer or any other device that's connected to the internet. And those links will then take you to the website themselves. And they are uh, functioning links. So you won't miss out on anything. Tonight's topic is publishing contracts and commissions. We're going to talk a lot about you know ways in which you can protect your work as an artist and also yourself. You know your ability to earn a wage, and you know that's really kind of the point of these these particular seminars for those of you that are really looking at turning this into a career. There's a lot of different ways in which we make money as artists, but you know our goal is really to teach you to be a working artist and. You know, for anybody that's joining in afterwards, uh, whether on YouTube uh, or even if you're new to our live stream, Distill Arts or Develop Skills and Transcend Limits Through the Arts, that's what the acronym means, uh, is a nonprofit arts mentorship organization that inspires, teaches, and hires emerging artists from underserved communities. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways in which we do that. Our programs primarily are focused on uh, teaching professional development skills, as well as various skills in, um, you know, publishing and uh, marketability, all of that. It begins with our poet artist development program, but for people who are maybe just kind of returning back to the arts after a hiatus, we do offer our Conchas y Café bilingual community writing workshops. They are writing focused, and because it is bilingual, we teach the classes in both English and Spanish. Every 12 weeks, it produces a zine called Conchas y Café Zine. Art Block Zine and Artistic Zine are two zines that also are produced on a regular basis by us. Once a year, we collect work from emerging artists throughout LA County, and in the case of Artistic Zine, neurodivergent artists across the United States, and we celebrate their work. 
through zines. We also have our Creative Impact series, which this year is focused on the social justice theme of a decent living. Um, that is something that is tied very closely to our Poet Artist Development Program. You can learn more about all of our programs on our website at dstlarts.org. And to start us off, to start the conversation off with everyone uh, joining in now, we have this quote from Ava DuVernay, uh, who's pretty pretty well known these days uh, as an American filmmaker, TV producer, and film publicist. And she is quoted as saying, all the traditional models for doing things are collapsing from music to publishing to film. And it's a wide open door for people who are creative to do what they need to do without having institutions block their art. So... What does this quote say to you, our happy people in the house? What y'all have to say about this quote? Jump on in. To me, it says that we have freedom to write, express our art, express our, our creativity, and that the field is open to do that without limits, but at the same time, it's not like it used to be when beginning we had the um when combination and the U U M C for instance, Joe McCuffism, a lot of people and say it was not accepted, and that there's no limitation, there's no no one controlling that versus how it is now. You look at social media and it's it's unfortunate, but it's Facebook and Instagram have put things on on their on social posts that we see that can be horrible. And there's no autonomy that controls that. And there's not a concern or the people who do that. And yet it, it happens. And it seems like there's less autonomy and more freedom to be creative. And like you said, it's a wide open door for people who are creative to do what they need to do without having institutions block their art. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about all the amendments. I mean, freedom of speech is obviously that amendment. I don't remember what it is, but that amendment can go with this for what she's saying also. Mm -hmm. and it's like anything it, it is. And it was just a good thing and a, and a bad thing. And yet what you read here and see via media can influence you or not influence you. And I think sometimes, depending on the generation that you grow from or that you're growing up in now is different. When I was at the age of a Generation X or a Generation Z, and things are different. Mm -hmm. And and uh, to me, the more things change, <clears throat> the more things change, the more they stay the same. And mm -hmm. that's also reflected to me throughout this, <clears throat> throughout this quote too. Because okay. although 2023, what happened 100 years ago was different, but yet it remained the same through history, culture, mm -hmm. evil, speak no evil, say no evil, you know. But we know that's not true because Facebook and Instagram, in other ways, are saying that, you know, through those social platforms. Right. So I think, in a nutshell, from what I got about your your response to this, is that. Um, social media has kind of allowed people a platform to do things that maybe they wouldn't have done before. Is that more or less what what I was supposed to get? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yes, she ran out of money with that one. And it, it's, it's true. I mean, everything's such an influence these days. I mean, means mm -hmm. like, for instance, having a child, having a baby, sexuality. What is your sexuality? What is this? What is that? I mean, I'm not saying those things for, as a for instance. It's like mm -hmm. a, it's a free for all. You know, um, 1984, George Orwell, Big Brother. Is that still happening these days? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this could be a, a debatable topic. Mm -hmm. I, I know, and I think you know, it can also be a generational, to a generational topic as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put generation into this. However, I feel how you grew up the generation that you're in or are born and depending on your age group 
can also make a difference too, or not make a difference. Right. Okay. Well, thank you, Ms. Michelle. You're welcome. Um, I did see that uh, Abraham was patiently waiting. He had something to add. Oh, well, my question was, when was this uh, quote written or spoken? Uh, do we know? I don't know exactly when, but um, this is, I think, relatively recently. Yeah, because it sounds more like a generation of the internet right. and all these social medias that supposed to kind of free us from the mainstream. Mm -hmm. but I think that was more true a couple of years back and it's kind of re, what's it called, calibrating to <laughs> the old. Mm -hmm. Let's see who has the most influence because again, the, the media has been controlled again. Yeah. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we look at the quote, you know, it's it's in some ways talking about how things have been leveled, right? All the traditional models for doing things are collapsing. Traditional models meaning like, you know, you used to have to get signed by a large, um, like a large record label or a large publisher, you know, in order to just have your work put out there. But now, you know, we have things like YouTube, SoundCloud, we have the ability to use um, print on demand, we can, even with something like Apple Books, you know, you can much more easily disseminate your stories, your messages in ways that weren't necessarily possible before. Um, and yeah, you know, to a certain degree, there's there are changes happening currently, you know, with social media, the people that are controlling the media. All of those things are maybe trying to take back some of the control. But the truth is that, yeah, now in this Internet age, we do have a lot of things that uh, are sort of for the people by the people now. You know, we, there's at least some higher degree of access for all of us and i feel like that's where this this is generally going in in terms of the the quote it's a wide open door for people who are creative all right any other comments or observations aside from ava Duvernay now being 50 years old according to moshe lynette i think that there's just two forces in constant tension um and on the i feel like this quote speaks to the fact that um that there are some like openings to for example like you mentioned like people making their own music right or uh someone starting their comedy career through tiktoks mm -hmm. versus you know before that not being an option but at the same time the neoliberal model just continues to it's going to reinvent itself right like capitalism is always going to be like oh this is happening so i gotta morph and like do this other thing and so for example you know um they'll be like oh we gotta have more black people in film and so they'll have a few more black people in film in a film right but they're still like the va the same values are still being like uplifted and the top executives are still like mostly white males right and so the and then there's also um media uh instead of being there being like a lot of cons a lot of companies like consolidating or even like um it's it's kind of like that illusion of choice where you think there's like, oh, there's all these people creating, but actually it's like three or four large media companies that are really deciding what movies are being shown in theaters, for example, or like three major label companies that are putting on shows and things like that. So it's like, I feel like both things are true. Um, yeah. But for example, with just like women creating content like there's this illusion that anybody could create content but when there's a dissenting voice people are still like women are overwhelmingly get like death threats women overwhelmingly will like um 
I don't know, be harassed, right? So yeah, it I feel like it's more complicated. It is. Yeah. I mean, you know, the quote makes, I think, an attempt to at least encourage people to think in ways that are maybe outside of traditional models. But even then, because technology does change so rapidly and because when it comes to the society that we're living in now, you know, and its need to sustain capitalism, things like uh, Facebook, which at one point was a, a relatively easy platform to navigate and find things that you never would have found before, you know, the algorithms started to take hold, right? And Instagram no longer was the platform for discovering a new star. It was now a platform to discover the next star that had the money to pay for the ads that then brought them to your attention, you know, whereas, you know, at one point it was more of an organic thing. So there's definitely, you know, a lot of that that we do need to um, kind of acknowledge and address, you know, through our actions as, as artists. And that's why it's really important that we really think about or consider, you know, the ways in which we can protect ourselves, the artwork that we create, um, and our living, because in the end, you know, we are in this because we want to find success in some form that at least allows us to, to offset some of the costs to creating art. Um, so, yeah, excellent observations. Thank you, everyone. And now, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about how some of these protections came to be. Uh, for that, I'd like to direct you to, to this uh, particular website. This next story that Abraham is going to share uh, with us is from Planet Money, the podcast. And this is the actual link uh, if you want to check it out afterwards. Um, again, this handout is available to download now from our Google Classroom. And anybody that's watching the live stream or the recording afterwards, you can always leave a comment and we can you know, provide it to you as well. But with that, I'm going to temporarily stop sharing my screen and hand it off to Abraham, who's going to tell us the story. Uh, you're on mute, Abraham. Yeah, I noticed this weird thing. Okay, we're back and hopefully you guys can see. And so let's begin with the story of today. This little story starts with David Joda Simon. He was a police reporter at the Baltimore Sun Bora from 1982 till 1995. And after he wrote his first book, Homicide, A Year on the Killing Streets, 1991, he gets an agent who tells him that it's a good shot this could sell in Hollywood. So his agent teams up with another agent at one of the biggest companies in their entertainment industry, Creative Artists Agency, CAAA. Eventually, David hears that a big A-list director wants to, the rights to his book, who made an offer to turn his book into an NBC TV series. Still, David talked to some other people and found that it was a low ball deal. And after some more negotiations, he got a little more money. Deal was made and the show runs for seven seasons, which is a good, good show then. Years later, David learns how to write for TV and wanted more than getting the rights from the book. So he planned to basically run his new project called The Wire. So David got a new agent from the same agency to handle his new TV deal. So before he continued this, before we continue this story, an agent manages David's deal in exchange for a commission, usually around 10%. So the agent Incentive is to be on Davy's corner, negotiating as high as a fee as possible. 
Okay, now that out of the way, let's continue. One day during the negotiation, Davy hears from his agent that there is a different financial model, not commission, but something called packaging. So here it is. Packaging is when an agent negotiates several of his or her clients, writers, directors, actors, etc., and presents them to a studio in a bundle. And David will not have to pay the 10% commission because instead the agent will get his or her money from the studio and a percentage from the profits. But also David learns that no matter what he as a writer gets from the deal, the agent still gets the same fee. So David said, wait a minute, then my agent has no reason to get me any more money. David later learns that not only he was being packaged in this new deal, but also that he had been packaged on his first deal, Homicide, and that the director who bought the rights for his book back then was in the same package, meaning his agent was representing both sides. David was, as you might expect, angry, but his current agent assured him that he had nothing to do with that first deal and that he would never be packaged again and that it was the way things were done. David ended up staying yet years after him and many many other writers saw how packaging was getting bigger and bigger and screwing them until on april 2008 several thousand screenwriters across the country fired their agents this was called the nuclear option and again you can um Follow the entire story in the podcast, Planet Money, Writers Revolt. And it's an update on the story. And again, I, you can check the, the link. And let's get back to the class. And any more quest questions, go for it. Let me stop sharing. How do you stop? I'm going to do this. That works. <laughs> All right. Any questions about what was happening in that particular story? Did anyone not yep. quite follow along? I have a question. Were, they, were, the, um, were, they, were the agents eventually sued? And was there also a union established for that? That was established so that the creators who, the creative control that occurred, I mean, like I said, the agents are the double dipping, and he or she knew that. They knew they were being slick. It's like they're being slick. And then they say, hey, but I have it from both sides. So I, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm getting everything from both sides. Many, 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 many. However, at the same time, with this revolt, was there a union to protect the creative people, the people who created to make these shows and made the who contributed these things, like a well, union or something? Like that. Uh, Michelle, so yeah, mm -hmm. there was a union, and it took several years for people first to cut up to it, like all big scams. It right. takes time for people to notice and also takes a lot of time for people to actually fight it because this is huge companies who were doing this. And um, again, after they all basically figure out all were basically creating a strike because of the union, the whole power of all the writers who were selling, selling the, to their uh, agents, you stop using this basically fraud of bundling people or we're going to fire you and they didn't believe it and all of a sudden all the agents were fired all the yeah. ones who didn't sign that they wouldn't be using the same technique and we had changes and then again everything you had to keep on fighting all <laughs> that's kind of the yeah. current events <laughs> yeah. that, that makes sense and thank you for saying that because that's not that's not fair and you think you're successful and yet you're being screwed again or being backstabbed or being 
dealing with hypocrites and people who are backstabbers and smiling in your face, you know, and yeah. Yeah, and it was definitely really unfair. And well, let's continue with a couple more um, stats and details. Uh, so agents and unions for where you need people, right? The purpose of an agent and an unions is to provide you, the artist, with a representation and protection in legal matters related to the licensing of your artworks. Both agent and unions can provide you with, and here's the list, professional connections, opportunities, talent representation, assistant, uh, assistant, assistant, what essentially, sorry, means agents sell your skills, talent, art, or your, on your behalf as much as possible. Unions representation provides you with networking and employment opportunities that ensure equitable pay. So yeah, unions help you a lot, a lot to charge better. <laughs> Explains and negotiation contracts. And again, explains is basically they will help you understand what is what you're about to sign on the deal that you're getting. Agents act inter, um, as intermediaries between their clients, you and the publishers, producers, studios, book publisher, et cetera, right? And agents incentive is to get you the best deal so that their 10 or 15% commission is larger. And again, this is kind of what the problem was in the story. The guys were getting that, but it's still, they decided, no, are you gonna play both sides to get more? They were like, um, Michelle was mentioning double dipping, which, okay. And unions often provide you with contract reviews to ensure you are being equitably paid and protected as an artist. And liaisons and uh, with attorneys. Agents are not attorneys, again, and you should not provide legal advice. Um, only a certified attorney can. Unions always have attorneys on retainers, um, specifically for their members. So yeah, that's another good reason to go for a union. You get a lot of benefits. One of them is having attorneys. Uh, liaisons with specialists. Uh, agents can help you with your uh, branding, public image, or even act as editors, uh, but they often defer to specialists for marketing, design, etc. Unions can also provide you with referral to specialists in support areas for an artist's career. So again, it's part of the whole package of being in a union. Well, depending on the union and the benefits. Um, here we have agent binding tips to consider when searching for an agent. Agents are incentivized to get you the best deal they can. They better you deal, the higher their 10 to 50% industry standard commission will be again. When searching, research who else they represent. If their client list includes writers, artists with similar styles and or backgrounds as yours, they could better be a better equipped to represent you unique work. Again, they have kind of the, the reach as well as the experience to handle your specific needs. Um, research um, what kind, what other prop, uh, properties they are have sold and to whom, again, part of the, the word saying, their connections. Same as above, if they have successfully helped similar art, uh, works to your find a buyer, then they might have the best connections in the industry for you. Understand the financial contractual obligations you have been agreed to. Agents shouldn't charge you a direct fee. Again, a direct fee. Their fees are typically deducted from your deals. Be aware if your agent requires exclusivity contracts that limit your ability to work with other agents and li licenses, your in um, intellectual property in other mediums, which happens. I know it happens to a couple of musicians who basically the agent just set on their contract so they couldn't work somewhere else, even though they weren't getting money. 
But as long as they had him like assigned to them, they were screwed. So make sure you do, are not finding yourself in that kind of situation. And um, next one or this different one? Yeah, there you go. And then uh, we have a couple of websites is to learn more about literally agent. Is it? Uh, do you say you wanted to quickly open this one, Luis? Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. so that everybody can kind of see where some of this information came from. Um, specifically, this is an article that came from Poets and Writers, which is a very well recognized uh, publication and also website that is a specialized resource for authors, poets, and um, artists working within the, the uh, storytelling mediums. So a lot of this information that we just covered came from here. Uh, and if you want to learn more, I highly recommend that you check this out um, because, you know, it gets into some other little details and, and other tips that uh, we only kind of touched on, but haven't quite 100% um, gone very deep into. But the most important thing to remember is that, you know, an agent is actually supposed to work for you um, in a lot of ways in partnership with you. And their incentive is to get you the best deal, not to bundle your, your work with, you know, other clients that they represent. They should be working for you as an individual client. Um, that's one of the, the things that definitely comes across in, in this particular um, like article from Poets and Writers. Additionally, the second link on the on the handout um, takes you to this database. And so if you want to look for an agent to help you with selling your manuscript to a larger publisher, to a medium sized publisher, and even to a certain degree, smaller publishers, uh, this particular uh, database is a pretty thorough one. And it helps you find different different types of agents, depending on whether you're doing, say, memoir, as you can see here, BIPOC voices, which is kind of like a new thing uh, in the creative world, right? More and more uh, people of color are being given opportunities and there is, you know, some level of recognition at, at larger companies that they need to have better representation. Um, so this may be one way in which you can have your work seen and reviewed by, by other uh, larger presses. Um, so, and they give you the, the general uh, interest from the, the different companies and their, their specific agents. Um, again, make sure that you go back to the article because the article here will tell you a little bit more about how to correctly engage with an agent. Um, the query letter is one of the ways in which a lot of people uh, kind of accept the work of an unsolicited manuscript. Uh, the query letter really does help with uh, introducing yourself basically to an agent. So any questions so far? We doing good? All right, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> so again, this handout does have active links. When you download it and you click on the link, it'll take you directly to those two websites. Now, power in numbers. This right here is essentially about um, unions and the way that a union functions. The core concept, obviously, behind a union is that you are working as a collective to show your strength as union members, right? There are different benefits that you get from being part of a union. Some of them we already touched on, like having access to an attorney. Uh, having someone that can review contracts or any kind of commissions that you might take on. You know, there's definitely benefits to being a union member. In addition to some of those things, though, there's also, you know, if you're working, let's say, within the, the entertainment industry and you are part of a union, there are certain minimum salary requirements that a, uh, a studio might be, you know, paying you as a union member. Um, this can also work across like, uh, you know, if you're within the music industry or really any kind of commercial creative industry where, you know, it, it's your intellectual property that is being kind of sold and traded uh, in exchange for, for money. Um, 
This is also going to be important when it comes to intellectual property, because you want to make sure that not only do you get credit, but you also get residuals or royalties. You know, those are the kinds of protections that not only benefit you in the, you know, immediate, but also in the long term, you know, as you, you know, continue to work throughout your career, you want to be able to have this passive income that is continually coming in. And to a certain degree, you also want that for your, you know, future generations, whether that be children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, you know, whatever the case might be, you can always, uh, put those kinds of uh, rights and, and, you know, things, licenses into trusts so that they can also benefit in the future. Unions do, to a certain degree, have some eligibility requirements, so that is something to consider. Um, you may need to have a minimum number of publishing credits, whether you're, you know, a new member or an established member of a union, you know, sometimes they they will, you know, ask to see like where you've had your work displayed. Um, the nice thing is that a couple of the ones that we found are also actually open to people who are, uh, you know, new, new to the industry. There are also costs, right? So no union is free. The reason why uh, unions charge dues of their members is because, you know, people have to get paid, right? Lawyers have to get paid. Other specialists that are contracted by the union have to get paid. So it comes out of that union fee, that union due, which in the long term is very much worth it because union members will always earn more than their non-union counterparts. So, you know, in the end, if you are part of a union, you, like I said, over the life of your career will earn more money. And, you know, even if you do lose, lose out on certain kinds of opportunities because they can't afford a unionized uh, creative worker, you know, that's probably okay because in the end, it's about being able to, to earn what, what you need to earn to have a, uh, a livable wage. Abraham? Well, just to again one of the cons is basically again sometimes you might not be able to get a job because you're part of a union they're not hiring just unions but as well as unions have rules so you may want to make sure that those rules align with <laughs> the way you work <laughs> yeah. yeah that is also something to consider um well, we did in our limited research that we were doing in preparation for this workshop um find a couple of unions that we found to be fairly useful for writers specifically. Um, and some of these do take people like, uh, you know, graphic designers and, and other uh, forms of, of uh, like visual storytellers. But this one right here in particular, the National Writers Union, you know, their eligibility is for, um, you know, professionals that are currently working. It is open to freelancers and also employed professionals, which is nice, uh, meaning that you do not have to be employed by a large company to be able to join this one. You can actually be working independently. Um, and this includes also people who write content for apps or for uh, websites. You know, if you're considered a blogger, you can also join this union. Um, if you write ebooks, you know, which is kind of like a niche market in itself, you can join this union. Um, autores que escriben en español, you know, as, as per their website, Escritores en Español. That is somebody, that is the uh, type of writer that they are open to, um, you know, uh, representing through their union, which I personally found funny, but obviously if you are working in Spanish language media, you know, this union is actually open to you, whereas not all unions are, um, unfortunately. Uh, some of the benefits, just like with a lot of different kinds of unions, but, you know, some of the trade unions that are for artists, um, this is something that I think is even that much more important. You are able to get, um, insurance right medical dental and vision insurance options or assistance with them uh, which is something that again you know if you're working independently as a freelancer that is going to be something that you will want to invest in um, just to protect yourself and, and your physical health and mental health uh, they also offer the ability to get press passes which you know if you're a writer that does do blogs or you know reviews or that kind of thing press passes are always very useful 
Um, there's also legal and career advice that they're able to provide you with and also grievance assistance. So if somebody decides to go back on a contract, you know, you can always do a grievance and they will help you with the legal fees. There's also um, assistance with traveling and promotion that they offer, which is kind of cool. You know, sometimes, especially if you're going to be self-publishing, you know, you will become responsible for your your own books, right? And the uh, the traveling costs and the promotional costs for that. So they offer that particular, uh, you know, perk of being a member. And they have memberships that start as low as $12.50 a month. So that's fairly affordable. I mean, if you can afford a Starbucks cup of coffee, you can afford being a member here. Um, and their their scale, their their uh, fee structure is sliding scale. So the more you earn, the more you pay. But even then, you know, it's still going to be worth it. Um, the other one that we found is the Authors Guild, and this one was one of the ones that I was mentioning where um, they do have certain eligibility requirements. Um, you have to have at least published one book in, um, you know any time within the past 18 months, basically. Uh, and you can also uh, be self-published and qualify if you earned less than $5,000 in the previous 18 months, which is nice. You know, there's a slightly lower barrier for eligibility uh, with this particular union. And they also have the Emerging Writers membership, which, you know, does have limited benefits, but um, if you are an unpublished writer, you can still join for either $100 a year or $9 a month. You know, not to sound too much like a commercial for these particular unions, but, you know, union membership is something that is worth it if if you want to really, again, consider your work sacred and protected. This is the website for the National Writers Union. You can learn, obviously, more about them by clicking here uh, through the, the handout. And, you know, just so that way, you know, you're on the right page, this is what it looks like. And then we also have the Authors Guild, which is the other one that, like I was saying, this one does take unpublished authors through their Emerging Writers membership program. Um, this is, again, just so you can see which website it is, this is the official one. Um, it's always good to make sure that you know where you're going, right? Um, so that's a little bit on some of the unions uh does anyone have any questions anything that they'd like to ask before we move on all right there's also other forms of organizations that might be good resources too they're typically called membership or trade organizations some examples would be like the academy of motion picture arts and sciences these are the people who are responsible for putting together the uh, the motion picture, you know, the Oscars, basically. Uh, they are a membership um, organization. They're not a union. And, you know, a lot of times membership organizations will host things like that, you know, special recognitions, award ceremonies, that kind of thing. With them, it is exclusively for artists who are working in the motion picture industry. Um, and, you know, there are particular dues that you pay, uh, which actually help fund programs that support emerging filmmakers, actors, and writers. Uh, as writers yourselves, if you decide to go down the screenwriting path, that could potentially be a useful membership organization to be a part of. There's also, for poets, the Academy of American Poets, um, which I'm not a member myself, but I do receive their Poem a Day newsletter, which is paid for in part by membership dues. So with them, if you pay membership dues, you are helping to support the creation of new work and also the dissemination and celebration of it. They also have grant programs that they offer uh, periodically through uh, partnerships that we that they have with other uh, membership organizations like the Community of Literary Magazines and Presses, CLMP, which Distill Arts is a very proud member of. And, you know, there's there's definitely other sort of perks to being a member if you decide to be a member for the Ameri of the Ameri Academy of American Poets. And then here locally in L.A., there's also Arts for L.A., 
Arts for LA is an advocacy group that with the support of membership dues, they do a lot of work to help ensure that schools um, and our specific communities are supported with funding for the arts. They um, advocate with the city and the county on a regular basis. They work very closely with LAUSD to create models for incorporating art into their curriculum. And in general, you know, they offer professional development, seminars, and other kinds of things like that um, that are pretty useful uh, for, for emerging artists and established artists. Regardless of whether you join a union, have an agent, or you know, join a trade organization, the idea really is to find people that are like-minded, to find organizations that will support you as an artist and who you feel best represent your interests, your particular um, you know, sensibilities when it comes to your art, to your social justice practice, to all of that. You know, don't feel like you have to join a, a uh, membership organization if they aren't representing you, if they aren't, you know, really ethical or in other ways um, kind of clashing with your, your individual identity. You know, the main idea, again, is find people who will be resources for you, you know, and who you can share ideas with. That's, that's really what it comes down to when you have to start looking for people right who who will help represent you now the publisher is obviously separate from the agent which is separate from you know your union and all of that a publisher has certain benefits that they are able to offer you and in this particular case this is sort of where distill arts kind of you know, maybe isn't 100% the same as like your average publisher, but you know, we would kind of technically still fall under this particular category. The institutions of old do still exist, you know, even though Ava DuVernay's quote sort of, you know, tried to say that they don't, um, they don't exist in the same way, they do still exist, um, but they are not quite the same sort of barriers for artists as they used to be. You know, they're not as much the gatekeepers as they once were. What a publisher is able to offer you, though, and this is something to consider if you want to go that route versus self-publishing, as many artists are doing, you know, they are able to offer you things like editorial guidance and copy editing. You know, an agent can help you with this, but a publisher absolutely will dedicate time to combing through your manuscript, making sure that you know, there are no omissions, you know, that things are fact checked if you're writing in, in nonfiction. Uh, they will make sure that things are spelled correctly. You know, there are no typos. Um, like 99% of, of errors will be hopefully caught by, by larger publishers. Um, Abraham, you raise your hand. Well, it's kind of like the agent who is, um, who's basically best interest for you to go to do well, right? But for a publisher, it's even better. I mean, because they really need you to, to be the best because you're also representing them. So yeah. that's kind of where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah, in the end, the publisher wants to really protect their image, right? So it comes down to quality control in a lot of ways. Now, one of the things that falls under that sort of quality control, though, is things like designing, printing, shipping, and distribution. You know, most publishers will almost never work one-on-one -on -one with the writer, with the, the original manuscript creator. Uh, they'll take the manuscript, they'll comb through it, make sure that things are edited in a way that makes sense, that works. However, you know, they won't really talk to you after that with, with regard to how they want the book cover to look, how they want the paper to feel, all of those things. Uh, so, you know, you are basically relinquishing control at, after submitting a manuscript. That said, you know, there's probably a higher guarantee that the book will be distributed to major markets, you know, to like a Barnes and Noble, you know, it'll be obviously available on things like Amazon, but it will go to places like Target, places like Walmart, you know, your books have slightly 
bigger reach in terms of distribution if you go with a bigger publisher. You know, that's not to say that you can't still get your book into like a small independent bookstore. It just means that you would have to be the one to actually do the work to get it into your local bookstore, whereas a publisher might not even be aware that your local bookstore even exists. They also will offer you some level of marketing support. You know, they'll announce that the book is released. They might invest in something like a, uh, you know, a billboard. They might invest in something like a, uh, I don't know, a spot on a TV show where they feel like your work will sort of resonate with the audience. But you really can't expect it to be too much other than just placing it in a larger bookstore. Uh, when it comes to like social media ads, set, setting up book tours, um, those kinds of things, that's probably more the world of an agent. Um, an agent would be probably the one that would help you with setting up a book tour, uh, or it would be you representing yourself as you set up your own book tours. So, you know, something to keep in mind if you decide to go with a larger publisher. In the world of self-publishing, a lot of these things end up falling on you. So, you know, if you want to have that full control and you are okay with, uh, you know, taking the time to invest in your own work, you know, you can definitely go down that route. Self-publishing has become a lot easier to do, and it is also becoming more and more accepted as a valid form of publishing. Where before, you know, it was looked down upon because it wasn't one of the big random house or penguin um, you know, books. Now a self-published book is equally as, as uh, recognized as a, as a work of quality art, especially if you take the time to invest in things like the design, in the copy editing, all of those things, they, they do have an impact on the end user, which is going to be your audience, the person that will buy your book. Um, the nice thing about self-publishing is that you can also work with like, you know, boutique uh, design firms. You can work with design firms that can make things look and feel more limited edition. You can charge a little bit more for things that are fine press books, you know, things that, that come across as being of a higher quality. That is always going to be one of the benefits of working with a smaller uh, design firm. And if you're going with the self-publishing route, that's, I think, a, a good benefit. Also, you can set higher royalties and you can set longer royalties, right? Where a lot of publishers will have a book available for maybe three to five years. You know, if you're self-publishing, you can have that book available for your entire life uh, and people can consistently buy it, you know, if they want the hardcover version and then later a paperback version, you know, and you're self-publishing all of these things. Those are things that you can definitely sell in perpetuity as long as you have the ability to continue printing them. Sometimes it helps to also just do limited runs of books. And in that way, the, the, the residuals will be maybe slightly smaller, but your book will get you, you know, maybe more attention down the line because it becomes a collector's item. But in the end, you know, that does mean that your marketing strategy would be custom tailored by you, you know, just like with a pu bigger publisher, you're going to be the one that's responsible for ultimately hyping up your book. A bigger publisher can only do so much and it's going to be on you to say, hey, you know, this is my new book. Come check it out. I'll be reading here. I'll be reading there. You can buy it on my website. You can buy it at the upcoming LA Zine Fest. I'll be at the LA Times Festival of Books. You know, like you're going to be the one that's ultimately hustling your book, regardless of whether you're self-publishing or working with a larger publisher. But you get to have more control in terms of the way your work is marketed um, if you are self-publishing. And in some ways, there's a bigger benefit to that. You don't come across as tokenized. Um, by, you know, a white run publishing house versus, you know, doing it for yourself. A quick note on intellectual properties. So, you know, I get asked these questions a lot regarding copyright and trademarking. Um, we've talked about this before, but the biggest distinction is that a copyright 
protects the rights of people who create artistic, literary, musical, dramatic, and certain other intellectual works. That includes things like software. It also includes things like, um, you know, logos and that kind of thing. However, the difference between a logo's copyright and a logo's trademark, you know, it comes down to the ways in which it's used. The individual artist can copyright a logo, but a company can trademark a logo to protect their image. What it comes down to with a trademark is that if the brand feels like someone copying their logo would be detrimental to the consumer, then they would go the route of trademarking it and then having it be something that is protected. Uh, in order for you all to understand, you know, what these particular websites are looking like and how they function, I did um, open up the, the website itself. So this is the U.S. Copyright Office website. It's just simply copyright.gov. And this is where you can learn about all the different ways in which you copyright your work. This is also the website that you would use to copyright it yourself. Um, it gives you the fee structure. It gives you the form online. So you can do this online. There's no need to send it by mail. There's no need to do anything other than just uh, uploading your document and paying the fees and you're good to go. The copyright will be valid for your entire life plus 70 years. So from the moment that you register your work until you pass and then another 70 years, that work will be protected by copyright. And it is something that you can transfer to your uh, descendants if you choose uh, in order to you know, protect the work to, to the degree that available to them. The trademark office... It's the U U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And again, this is where you would go to find out how to trademark your work um, if you are a business uh, and if you are acting as a business. Um, so, you know, this, this is a bit more specific to that. Uh, but let's say you do design your own logo and you design your own um, unique process for doing something, you can trademark it and uh, have your work protected in that way as well. But in most cases, as working artists, you're probably going to be more interested in the copyright over the trademark. Any questions regarding either of those? Or comments? I have a question. Yes. Um, now, as you know, there are us here on this call who have their work published through digital arts. Mm -hmm. And is that, even though it's, it's, it's like a, I won't say like an anthology, but it's, it's clearly a body of work from various people. Mm -hmm. Is that considered intellectual property? Is that considered perpetuity or? That? Yeah. So that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, Anything that you create that is a work of art, literary, music, visual, all of that, as, as defined by the Copyright Office, right? That is all considered intellectual property, and it is something that you own as the author of it. Um, you can legally protect it by going through the whole process of trade of, sorry, registering it with the Copyright Office. Any work that is featured in our Conchas y Café zines, art block zine, artistic zine, you still own the work. You are only licensing it to us for the purpose of appearing in that particular issue of our publication. What we offer through the, um, you know, the process of applying to the program and, and stuff like that is just, you know, when you sign a form, the form for enrollment, you know, it basically is saying that you are, you know, agreeing to license the work to us and, you know, for us to publish it. There is no clause in our enrollment agreement in our enrollment forms that say that we now own the work and that you are giving it to us forever. You can still go off and use it for whatever purposes you you find, you know, you can incorporate anything that we've published into future publications. 
Um, we don't even require that you actually uh, inform other people that it's been published in one of our uh, particular works. However, you know, if you do have something that's appeared in Conchas y Café or an art block or whatever, uh, some other publishers might actually say, well, sorry, it won't, we won't be able to, to uh, publish it. Um, even though you know we don't we don't claim any rights on it any first first rights, but that's actually something that we're going to get into uh, next. But good question, Ms. Michelle. I hope that answered it. So licensing, you know, I just mentioned it right now, but there are certain things to consider or to understand when it comes to. Um, you know, licensing and what licensing means. These are certain terms that you may come across as you begin working within the arts world as an independent artist or as someone who is represented by an agency, by, you know, a union, whatever the case might be. Licensing itself specifically refers to how, when, where, and for how long other people can use your artwork. Again, you own your artwork unless if someone contracts you in a work for hire situation, right? If you are licensing your, your work, you can still copyright it and the publisher can own the copyright too, but they would only own the copyright to the physical object that is designed and produced by them. You would still hold the copyright to your original manuscript. So the intellectual property is yours, you are licensing it to them, and then they are turning around and producing a work considered a book, you know, and that's something that they could then copyright. Um, it gets a little bit fuzzy in those particular cases, but the idea is still generally the same. It is something that you are licensing for a fee, and they can only use it for a certain amount of time under certain circumstances, whatever your, you know, publishing agreement says. A legitimate license agreement will set those limits to how it's used, how you are paid, and also, more most importantly, is the escape clause, right? The escape clause is going to be any kind of clause or phrase in the agreement or the contract that says that both parties can terminate the agreement based on X, Y, and Z, and it says how you go about doing that. That is really important. And that is something that I definitely recommend that if you are ever asked or invited to publish your work with, an, with a publishing house, however small or big they are, that you ask for a licensing agreement, some sort of publishing agreement that outlines all of those things that are under this particular heading. A work for hire contract is typically when you are commissioned to do something. Uh, Abraham shared with me earlier today that someone commissioned him to do an illustration of their pet. You know, that would be considered a commission. And in that particular case, Abraham would be working for hire. Now, these tend to be short term and they tend to be for commercial work. So these are things where, you know, you might say get a, a set fee for completing a project and then that's generally it. A lot of times these work for hire agreements are at will, meaning that, you know, you could get fired from the job if your performance isn't satisfactory, or you can leave the job if you're not happy with those conditions. Again, a contract is really important to have to at least outline how much you get paid up front and how much you get paid after the work is delivered. That is, generally speaking, a good practice to have if you are working on commissions. You know, if someone is hiring you to create artwork for them, it's just a good way to protect yourself from ultimately getting screwed after buying, you know, the supplies or materials or whatever it is that you might need to create the artwork. Also, a lot of times these will have clauses, these kinds of contracts will have clauses where the person hiring you will own the intellectual property afterwards. This you will see a lot of times if you are working for like a graphic design firm or if you're working for like say a TV show, you know, and you're writing and producing work 
for them to ultimately publish. You won't necessarily own the work. You could still get credit as the, the person responsible for developing the intellectual property, but because you're getting paid a fee to create it, you normally will not own the intellectual property for the same amount of time, much less have the ability to copyright that work. Um, again, you know, this is something that, that does ultimately mean that you won't necessarily keep the original work that you create, but it is always good to request permission to use your artwork for portfolio purposes. You know, you want to still be able to say, yes, I worked on this and this is work that I have created in the past when you are trying to get other gigs. So, you know, in an, in, in a work for hire contract, make sure that that particular clause is included. That way you are able to, again, continue promoting yourself as a working artist. Because uh, in the end, we're always trying to get gigs, right? Other things to be aware of is things like Creative Commons. You can actually, you know, take advantage of Creative Commons as an author, as a writer. Um, in some ways, it's similar to things like AI, you know, chat GPT and the way that those sort of things function. You know, it's using other works that are open source. You know, not necessarily in the tech sense, but, you know, things that are available to you as like stock images um, so that you can share it, repost it, remix it and create it, create something new out of it. Um, Creative Commons is a way in which you can also get your work out there to have other people, you know, look at it, potentially purchase it. There are different levels of licensing that are available through Creative Commons. Sometimes, you know, if you are even like, say, taking a picture of the sunset, right, and you upload it to a stock photo website, you know, there is a certain level of licensing that you can uh, assign to it. And Creative Commons is maybe one of the lower levels. You would still potentially get credit for the original, um, but you can also actually sell the stock photo and, you know, make a, make a small profit off of that if it gets sold enough. Um, you can learn more about Creative Commons by going to the website here. We won't go into that too much, but it is something to at least, um, you know, know of, be aware that it exists. Open source normally refers to software or source code. Um, you know, this is something that is made public by the author it's themselves or that, you know, and then it's, again, more tech related. If you are working in a tech space and you are having open source uh, media made available, you know, that is also something that you can potentially, you know, set up with different levels of licensing. Um, and a thing that you could potentially take advantage of if you want to build your own website or build your own app using the source code that someone else uses for their particular work. The source code, however, you would not be able to, to uh, copyright or trademark. So that's a lot, but as it relates to all of you here in our program, you know, we have uh, a little look here at our publishing agreement, the one that Distill Arts actually uses. So should you decide that you want us to actually publish your chapbooks, um, you know, that option is available to you as you kind of come towards the end of, of the program year. This is the what our publishing agreement actually looks like. And you know, you can see here there's certain information that we would need from you. Um, the sample book title can always be changed. That's not necessarily something that, you know, once you say that's what I want to title my chat book, you know, that's what it's gonna be. Um, but generally speaking, this is this is what you will find on a good majority of publishing agreements from most publishers. Again, we tend to be a little bit more generous than your average publisher. So, uh, you know, you will more than likely see more restrictive terms in, in other publishing agreements. But um, for us, you know, you need to meet a minimum page count, as you can see here, of 25 pages uh, submitted to us in the form of either a Microsoft Word file or a Google Doc file for written work. If you are doing anything that is illustration based, 
Um, your work, your illustrations need to be scanned images or at least, uh, you know, digital images that have a minimum 300 PPI resolution. Uh, if you're working in digital media or photography or anything like that, illustration, you'll generally know what that means. And if you're doing a combination of that, then it just needs to be clearly marked. Um, again, you know, this is this is what you will receive if you decide that you want to publish through us. The most important things to look for in a publishing agreement, just like we already covered, are things like how long will the publisher be granted permission to publish your work? Because again, that's what a licensing agreement is for. In our case, in this particular section, you can see here that it's for a period of, of up to three years from the date that it, that this is signed. Um, as much as I would like it to be forever, it isn't forever. Uh, and, you know, there's good reason for that, because we want to give you the opportunity to be able to continue developing your work, to continue, you know, basically pushing it into the world and having your stories told on your terms. Uh, we also are, you know, not necessarily exclusive. You know, we are asking for exclusive rights to print, publish, distribute, sell, and license the rights to any and all editions or formats of the book in the original language that it is written in. Um, but we are also saying here that your work is theirs. I'm sorry, that the work is is yours and that you have the opportunity to actually sell it in other formats, right? You can um, you can buy the book itself at cost, you know, so you don't have to pay the shipping fees. You don't have to pay like retail price when you buy extra copies from us. You can buy it at the wholesale price. Um, and you have also the ability to uh, present this in in like say an ebook format if you want to do that. You can uh, sell the the rights to turn it into a film, to turn it into a music video. I mean, you have the ability to do a whole lot of other things aside from from just the book, right? Um, we also have a, a clause in here regarding the design and the cover art. You have the ability to select your own cover artist. Um, you will be responsible for finding that artist, paying that artist, and ensuring that you have an agreement with them that allows us to use the work that they create for you. Um, again, that's ultimately a work for hire contract that you would be creating. And if you don't want to go that route, then you and I can work on you know, the development of your particular cover art. Editing wise, we will be collaborative in the editing process. That's another one of the things that we include in our particular uh, agreement here. And, you know, we also assign an ISBN number from the moment that you you say you want to publish with us. So uh, this is the, the general code for our ISBNs. Um, and the X's here would be replaced with the current number that is assigned to your individual manuscript. Um, this is also another way in which, uh, you want to make sure that, that you're getting equitably treated. So here you'll see that we pay a 50% royalty on all copies sold to you by us. Um, all that gets paid to you. Most publishers from, from what I've seen, from what I've read, uh, will only give you like about a 25 to 35% uh, royalty on any copy partly because they are assuming that um, through the advance that they provide you, you know, that is going to offset the sales of the books up to a certain degree. Once that is covered by the first run of books sold, then they will begin paying you. Um, it's not, not immediate, right? And after that, it's also, you know, their basically taking out their cut for the marketing, the shipping, the distribution, all of those things. In our particular case, that 50% is off of retail. It's not off of the uh, wholesale price. So we keep really only enough to cover the cost of the printing and the shipping. Um, and we pay the taxes, the sales taxes, all of that. You don't get penalized for that. 
So in a lot of in a lot of ways, to be completely honest with you, Distill Arts ends up losing money every time that we publish one of your manuscripts. But that is not the point. The point is that we are giving you the opportunity to have your work shared with the world, which, in my opinion, is equally, if not more important than Distill Arts turning a profit uh, for every book that is sold. Um, and then there's also the payment schedule. So you want to know when you're getting paid. And again, all of these are things that you want to see in a publishing agreement if you decide to go to another publisher, to go with someone outside of Distill Arts. You know, these are things to help protect you in the case of any kind of, you know, legal uh, issues that might happen. And that's also where, you know, you have clauses like this one where, you know, if there are any kind of arguments or disagreements between the publisher and the artist, you want to be able to have that outlined. What are the processes? What are the things that you can do to protect yourself from having your work misrepresented? Um, and also, you know, payments by the minute. Uh, but, you know, the, these are definitely things that, that you want to include in your, um, in your uh, publishing agreements. Plus, you also want to be very much aware of where the publisher is located and which state governs the, the uh, agreement, right? So if it's a publisher that's in New York, your experience with New York laws might vary, you know, compared to... California laws, which tend to be a little bit more uh, strict in certain ways. Um, so again, you know, the final part here, uh, just a lot more legal stuff, you know, uh, should the publisher default in complying, you know, and doesn't fix it within 30 days, you have the right to uh, you know, have all your work go back to you. The book will no longer be in print. Um, you know, there's other other language in here related to, um, you know, how how things can be handled in terms of the accounting, all of that very tedious stuff. But again, you know, this is exactly what our publishing agreement looks like for those who might be interested. And again, if you want to actually work with someone to create a cover for your chapbook, once we get to that phase in our program and you want to publish it through Distill Arts, you will need to create a work for hire contract. So if you are creating a work for hire contract, make sure that you have these things included. How are you going to pay them? Remember to value the work of the artists that you hire and pay them equitably. Don't be cheap you know, pay them what they deserve. Um, also designate how and when they will get paid. If it's a lump sum or if it's in split payments, make sure that you live up to that and you honor that. Um, and the same goes for the way that you create one for somebody that is hiring you, you know, make sure that you make, make out, make those details out very clearly so that you don't lose out on, uh, you know, getting paid. Um, and, you know, there's other things like the use terms, right? You know, again, if it's work for hire, that usually means that you get to own the rights to the work uh, in terms of how it gets used for, um, you know, for future purposes, right? So uh, do take into consideration also other uses of the work by the artist. So be courteous to them and allow them uh, or make sure that you are allowed the opportunity to use the work as promotional material for their portfolio, website, social media, all of that good stuff. And also a work for hire contract is a great way to, you know, outline the specifications for how you want the work to be completed and delivered to you. So make sure that you, you know, are thorough when you're creating a work for hire contract. Then one last note on licensing and selling your rights. Um, these are different scenarios in which you could potentially license your work. So you would obviously be licensing it as a book if you want it to come to Distill Arts, for example. Um, but if you want to then turn your manuscript into something else to continue earning off of that same manuscript, you could always license it as a film or a movie, it could become a TV show, it could become a play. Uh, we're talking about even music before and audiobooks. You know, those are those are different ways in which you can license 
a written literary manuscript. Also, think of digital media. You know, there's um there's a number of movies recently or even TV shows that were licensed from videos and video games. The Last of Us, the TV show, that series is a licensed work from the video game, The Last of Us. So, you know, that's another way in which you can potentially earn off of the same manuscript and just now repackaged in a new way. You can also do things like augmented reality elements. You know, if you're an illustrator or a photographer, um, what is a videogram? A videogram is a type of moving image that uh, basically looks like a GIF, but it's just one element within the frame that is moving. Uh, sometimes they're called videographs. Um, and they're pretty cool. They're like, you know, just digital art that, that again, has certain elements of, of motion to them. This is especially helpful if you are creating like a GIF or if you're creating a, you know, sort of custom animation for like, say, a website and a person wants to use it. Uh, you know, sort of going back to the idea of stock photography, stock images, that kind of thing. Um, virtual reality is becoming more and more discussed in the tech world. So, you know, if you are a visual artist or working within visual mediums, you know, that's another way in which you can also uh, repackage existing work and license it out. Uh, there's even potential ways in which you could do like uh, virtual reality poetry recitals, you know, and that could be another way in which your work gets licensed and repackaged for future sales. Print media is kind of an obvious one, you know, you can turn a work into a magazine, a zine, you can turn it from a zine or a magazine into a book, you know, there's different ways in which you can repackage certain things and create new, unique ways in which people can experience the same work of art. Um, and again, that goes probably more towards like the the photographers and and illustrators um, of the of the world, where you know they could turn things into like coloring books. You know, black and white images can be easily turned into line art and then turned into a coloring book. Uh, you can actually specifically make a comic that has no letters, and a person can kind of fill in their own words, right? So there's a lot of different ways in which you can uh, approach print media and then, of course, toys and merch. So, you know, if you have uh, whimsical characters as part of your stories or if you have, um, I don't know, some sort of thing that that uh, is unique to your work, even your logo, as an example, that is something that could be turned into a desk supply. It could be turned into a coffee mug. Um, you know, that's where the housewares would come in. It could be hoodies and T-shirts. It could be dolls and action figures. It could be even a playset um, and stuffed animals. So a lot of different ways in which you can license your work and earn residual income. So with all of that said, you know, we definitely encourage you all to think about different ways in which you can have your work licensed. You know, Money isn't everything, but it sure helps when you have it. And as working artists, you know, those are things that you will constantly be kind of working towards, you know, as, as you want to create new things, new experiences, tell your stories. And, you know, what better way to, to sort of prepare yourself for this eventuality of being a working artist than to really start thinking now about how you want to license your work. What are other ways in which you can capitalize on your talents, tell your story, and do it in a way that really, you know, resonates with people. So if part of your long-term strategy is to turn a short story into a film, then start thinking about how you want to go about doing that. What are some of the ways in which you can set yourself up for success now so that you're not lamenting in the future? because your work was somehow stolen or taken advantage of. So, um, As always, Abraham, myself, and Angie are available to answer any questions you might have. 
for anyone that is curious about our other programs who's watching on the live stream or on YouTube later, you can always go to our website here at distillarts.org. You can definitely follow us on social media for updates about our programs and whatnot using at distill arts. And, you know, any kind of uh, likes or comments are always welcome to our content. And any questions that are, you know, pending, feel free to, to ask either now or uh, later on the comment sections of our YouTube or uh, other social media, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And I do see a hand raised from Heidi. Yeah, uh, thank you. This is a wonderful speech. Yeah, so I like your idea before you said uh, we can uh, from a book to the movie. Uh, but uh, I think I have a wonderful Chinese girl story. She name is Felix's sister. So I always wanted to be movie because she is very special. She is famous in China, but uh, uh, she changed the uh, life direction to be moved to America. She have a lot of special story. So I think this to be movie uh, can help American people understand Chinese America. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but uh, my question about uh, what I can do, uh, first step, uh, from ideal, uh, to movie. So it's a long life journey. So thank you so much. Um, I mean the first step with really the the case of most creative things is to write it down, right? Even if you don't have a full script to turn it into a movie. You know, start by writing the story, maybe make an outline of the story. It doesn't have to be complete quite yet in order for someone to be able to help you later with completing the, the story in a way that can be presented to a, a studio if that's that's the way you want to go. Um, but definitely, you know, take the time to develop the story, turn it into something that you feel proud of, and then, you know, make the effort to find either an agent or, you know, someone that can help legally represent you uh, in, in the search for, you know, the, the studio that wants to maybe produce it. So that would be my advice for you, Heidi. Oh, thank you so much, you mean? Yeah, I, uh, I can alternate this whole story I even I didn't finish this whole book because uh, to be more way different way uh, and uh, yeah different uh, uh, writing book. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, and you know if you decide to write it as a book, you can always adapt it afterwards into a script. That's fairly common. So. Any other questions or final comments from anyone joining us now? I have a question. I even though I know this is this is concluding and finished. Um, when will there be an opportunity to continue to have a chat book? And is there a minimum or maximum that's suggested to write in regards to if a poem or prose without being too much and without being too little? Uh, you wanna, uh, know, are you asking poem. how long are you asking how long a, a single poem or are you asking how long your manuscript should be a manuscript because you know i don't uh, we've we've don't gone through this actually very a lot of times miss michelle and um and i just talked about it earlier too while we were reviewing the publishing agreement in order, in order for distill art to be able to publish something, we need it to be a minimum of 25 pages. Um, generally speaking, okay. our goal okay. is to have your work be approximately 60 pages, um, up to okay. you know, maybe even 70, 75, but that's sort of pushing the higher end of, of what our budget can actually accommodate. But again, the minimum is 25 pages. That's eight and a half by 11 inch pages. That's not okay. necessarily the same thing as what the final product is going to be. It's just a general page count. And this is, again, for a chapbook, not a full length book manuscript. So there is a difference. 
Um, and, you know, when it comes to publishing with Distill Arts, you know, just like any other publisher, we want to make sure that the quality is, is top notch. You know, you are in a lot of ways representing what we teach through our programs. So, you know, we take the time to really help you develop that manuscript, you know, and if it's something that can be completed within the year of being enrolled in our program, then that's great. If it's not completed within the year, you know, we do give a couple of extra months in order for that chapbook to be completed. Um, but, you know, in your particular case, Ms. Michelle, we've been working on it for many, many, many months. Um, you, you, one could even say years since you've been in Conchas y Café for so long. So, um, you know, you're, you're definitely on the right path. It's just that in, in regards to that, we, I know we spoke about it before and I know what my theme is and all that. I just want to get it, have it ready. And I'm not quite ready for that yet. Now, so, but it's something that I will be doing and I will, I intend to do that. It's just that I have not, I didn't make it my goal to be done before when I wrote my goals, when I wrote my ideas and stuff, I did not, I know I gave a date, what I wanted to do versus what I am doing. It was a two different thing. So yeah. and that's why we've been dedicating all these many Wednesday nights to trying to get everyone uh, working on a regular basis, editing their work and, you know, really being prepared to have their manuscripts published. So um, we hope that it's not been in vain. Um, and, you know, we believe in, in all of you who are in the program, so we know that it's within you to have it ready. Um, and again, you know, we are somewhat flexible with how long it would take, uh, but there is a certain point where we have to say, okay, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta wrap it up and we just have to present it. You know, it's not a, uh, the more we dwell on it, you know, the more opportunity there is to, uh, sort of let things slip through the cracks and we want to just stay as focused as possible. Um, so that's that's where that's why for the next um, several weeks, basically the next two months, we are dedicating our weeks, our Wednesday nights to finishing up your manuscripts and having them ready to be, you know, reviewed and designed over the summer. So. That's it. Okay. And another question is this: when, when we, 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 you, you know, the last question I asked you, my phone, um, unfortunately, even there got cut off, and I had, and I had, to, and I had to come back. That's why I came back late. So I'm not it's due to my phone. I'm not sure if my phone or my wiring or you know, what have you, have you. But if I wanted to find out, that's why I came back later. Sometimes I think, I think the environment that I'm at can make a difference also versus being where I should be in, in this building that. That I'm in yeah. because I know that it can, it can be spotty. I'm not in the library, but I'm wondering if it's the environment that I'm in. While I'm in a certain place where the frequent the environment is not. Well, I accurate. don't. I don't have any control over that, Miss Michelle. That, that's, that's, that's entirely up to you. So, I um, I my as as far as as far as the uh, you know, if you missed any information, this is being recorded. And it will go up on YouTube um, in a few weeks. Uh, definitely not more than two weeks since I am getting caught up on all of the video editing that I needed to get done. So um, okay. you will be able to find the the answer to whatever question that was. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't remember, but you know you will be able to get the answer that you that you were looking for, um, okay. one way or another. And either way, you know next Wednesday we'll be here working on your manuscripts um, and hopefully getting them ready to publish. So. You can always okay. ask the question again next week when we come back. Okay. And then also, I want to ask you how was it? We how was Sunday? How because it's Saturday, Christmas, and I oh. had fun. We had great time, as you know. It was so fun. How, how was that, that's irrelevant to to our live stream audience and and to the recording. So we'll we can always talk about it again again next Wednesday. All right. Okay. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. All right. No problem, Ms. Michelle. All right. So. Um, yeah, any last questions? Any final thoughts? No? All right, everyone. 
Oh, yes, Heidi, did you have a question? Uh, Ali, the big thank you. Yeah, because today it's important information because uh, your high recommendation, this is about uh, uh, two different uh, writer uh, union. I need to uh, become a union of number. Uh, it's uh, hope, very hope me get O one visa. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, there's definitely benefits to that. Um, don't feel pressured to go into one now if you're not ready to, but um, long term, I definitely do recommend that everyone become unionized uh, in some form or another through through their work, uh, because there are more benefits than there are, uh, you know, disadvantages. So, um, yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we'll leave it at that. So, uh, I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your week. For those of you in the program, we'll see you again next Wednesday with our regular workshopping schedule. And we'll get those chapbook manuscripts ready to publish ASAP. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a good night. Thank you to our, our live stream and YouTube crowd. Y'all are great. Take care. Bye.